I borrow a lot of these slides from Dr. Lisa because I thought they were pretty good and I didn't just want to reinvent the wheel and then I kind of, there's a couple animations and stuff that are in mind in there to help kind of put parts together. But when we get done, we're going to basically move forward into our last biochemical molecule group. But then we're going to circle back because that DNA group is going to tell you the DNA is used to basically code to make protein. All right, so is that, that all good? So basically, I'm going to, this is kind of her description of the four groups, but this is good. Right? Uh, her lipids aren't maybe quite as broad as ours, but we remember that lipids, right, basically hydrophobic. So let's just kind of remind ourselves that this is kind of like final review, kind of reminding you. I got four biochemicals, right? We've learned three of them now. So lipids, and how would you characterize a lipid? What are you going to see in there and go, oh, that's a lipid by looking? Chains, or in this case, what are these more like? rings, but the bottom line is they are carbon hydrogen, right? So they don't like water, right? So they're, they're not water soluble. They're more what we call oil soluble. Is that, everybody good with that? Now within those, there might be a couple functional groups. You know, phospholipids have some phosphorus in them. Triacylglycerides have some sort of ester in it, maybe. It, they, sometimes they cleave and make kind of carboxylic acid ends, right? But basically, you just look and see that big long hydrocarbon chain. None of the other four groups have the long hydrocarbon chain. Okay? Second group, carbohydrates. And there's nothing in there. That's good. What would I see if I had a structure of a carbohydrate up? Real giveaway, like, oh my gosh, functional groups in organic chemistry, are these are all over the place in the carbohydrate. What is it? Alcohol. So I'll see, it'll be just littered with alcohols. It's OH, 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 sometimes, you know, six carbons, six alcohols. Loaded, right? You with me? So then we just finished amino acid proteins. Now these are a little more specific. So let's just start with an amino acid, because that's pretty straightforward. What are the three components? You know, there's four components in every amino acid, but these three are always the same in every one. What do you got? What's that? Carboxylic acid. Carboxylic acid, that's one end. Perfect. Very, si very simple central carbon. I'll give that one away. That's two. It's just nothing. I mean, it's just a single carbon that holds the carboxylic acid to the, it's the other end. Not aldehyde. What is it? Amine. There you go. So there's an amine on one end, carboxylic acid on the other end, held together by a single carbon. And then off that carbon going the other way, besides the H, right, there's just this thing we call, right, side chain. And that can vary. But as far as what would mark a protein, you'd go, ah, okay, that's... Now, when the, when the amino acids link, right, when they link, the carboxylic acid and the amine interact and they make a new functional group. But this is predominant throughout the protein chain now. Carboxylic acid plus amine makes amide. So just kind of getting this in your head, right? Every one of these, I can just go like this. Carbon, there's an amine. There's your carboxylic acid. Some sort of R group, I'll call it R1. And then I got another and, uh, amino acid right next to it. I'll call that R2. We're going to practice this today. We're going to make some of these, so this will be good. You, get, you kind of get this stuck in your head. Do you, does everybody look up here and say, oh yeah, here's the fun, you know, no, not tons of alcohols, no long aliphatic chain, no long uh, water heating chain, right? So this is the, the amino acids. Everybody okay with that? I got two of them up here. 
But when they start to chain together, what happens right here? What gets knocked off? Water. Water. So common, right, in biology, isn't it wild? Not by itself, right? There's something that makes this happen, right? Um, and then, let me get an eraser so I'm not way too full of out of my hand. Nice back here. Can't go over that space now. Cozy in there. All right, so here we go. So one of these is gone. That's gone. And then the link goes like this. Right? So if I just replace that with just a big old it's kind of out of place, but you get the idea, right? Oh yeah, that's an amide. Plus water. And that's a strong bond. And my bonds are very strong. Cool. Makes sense. That makes the protein. And then that's where we ended up. And today we're gonna we're gonna branch into the nucleic acid business. All right. So, here are your proteins. So again, right, there's an end, there's your amine terminal end. We're going into amides, see it? Amide, amide, and then all of a sudden, oh, there's the carboxylic acid terminal end. And then I tried to teach you guys, hey, the carboxylic acid sometimes deprotonated, so it looks like this, and sometimes it's protonated, so it looks like this. So don't let that throw you off. Good? There you go. Good stuff. Okay, today we're going to work on the nucleic acids. So, these are the things you hear, DNA and RNA. So we're going to have to... It tells cells what to do. That's kind of one way they might say it. But basically what it does is it codes for all the proteins that drive us, design us, and make us. So within the DNA, RNA code, we basically have everything that makes us, us. All right, Thompson, round 30, you're losing your hair. All right, cool. You have a big old long arms like you're 6'3", but you're really only six foot, but that's okay. And, you know, right, all this stuff's going to happen. Right, that's all in my DNA code. Make sense? All right, so what we got to do is kind of say, okay, what discriminates this from the other? So we'll, we'll get into that a little bit. But I just want you to know right now, because we've already said, okay, proteins, right, they have quite a few different functions, right, muscles, that's the big one, right, followed by connective to muscles, which is like um, cartilage, and then actually then a lot of enzymes and protein, or uh, hormones, right, are protein in nature. So that's that piece. So this codes for them. So that's what it does. That's its job, to make proteins in essence. And then we've already talked about this, you know, acids. Okay. So this is kind of what we're going to focus on a little bit today is we're going to just talk about how that makes proteins. So we'll do a little practice with that. That's kind of cool. It's a cool procedure. All right, let's see what all is part of the DNA. So again, just like over here, you were like, okay, I'm looking for amide groups. I'm looking for that R group. That would be like, if I saw polyamide, I would go, oh, that's protein. If I saw individual pieces that have the amine and the carboxylic acid, I'd go amino acid, right? Those are kind of subgroups of each other. Here we're gonna look at these things. This is all the fundamental parts of what makes up DNA and RNA. So it's interesting, but there's a sugar. The problem is it doesn't look very sugary, right? Because what's it missing? To be a really, like, giveaway sugar. A lot of alcohols. Like, it's been taken off. Some of them, are, in fact, we call it deoxy, meaning we took off some of the alcohol, deoxy, ribonucleic acid. That's what that means. But that is the ribo sugar. That is what's running up the backbone along with this phosphate group. So it's a sugar and a phosphate that's making this chain. And then out here, these are called bases. We'll just call them bases for now. But for you guys, this is basically in, in organic chemistry, that means it's amines, right? Those are bases. We just learned this with the 
uh, proteins, we said, hey, if you have an NH2, right, we call that a basic group if it's hanging out by itself. On the arc, you know, the side chain has an NH2, you're like, oh, that's a base. Does that make sense? So these are the parts. Ribose sugar, phosphate, and a base. And those bases, so one chain runs over and the base reaches out and grabs the other base and then that makes another chain and they link across the bases. The bases bond to each other. So these make the DNA strands and then these kind of aggregate into these big chromosomes which really carry our genetic information. So that's kind of wild. So we sometimes just call that group the nucleotide. It's kind of a generic phosphate, cyclic sugar, nitrogenous base, right? You see it? Now one thing about this is, okay, there's a five prime sugar and there's a three prime. This is the way it connects. So this is interesting. This is so if I think back to like my sugar structure when that becomes cyclic. There's a lot of OHs hanging up and down. But there's this one OH that's kind of hanging off a chain over here. And that's one of the linkers that it uses to get hooked up to the phosphate group. And, and almost below it and one over, there's another alcohol that just break, breaks down. So that's called the 3-5, the 3-5-5-prime. Three five, the three prime, five prime. But the giveaway for me is that there's a, a ring with a carbon above it. That's the giveaway of the 5 prime end then the other connection down the chain is basically kind of out of the ring, right? This is basically going through what had formerly been an alcohol, and it just connects down. So if I was doing ribonucleic acid, right, if I was just doing a structure like that, remember how it makes the ether when it gets turned. So one of these actually goes off like this, and then, you know, you got a alcohols, alcohols, and of course, alcohols, right? That's, how, that's kind of the base of the sugar. This is the part, is the five prime, that goes up through this oxygen to make the chain, and then this next door neighbor goes down this way to make the chain. So that's where you hear five prime, think of that carbon sticking out of the ring. Then the other three primes easy enough to see because it's still in the ring. Is that okay? Is everybody with me? There's something about the directionality that that's going to be important later. So when we when the DNA gets read, it reads from five prime back through three prime. It doesn't start at three prime and read the other way. It reads at five prime down. That's why you need to know that orientation. Okay. So now look, everything looks very similar in DNA and RNA, except for the piece that's missing down here. See, there's the alcohol that would be in RNA. That would still be part of the chain. You can still make the chain, right? There's the five prime, three prime, the chain just keeps going. This one has an alcohol hanging out down there. If I get rid of that oxy, deoxy, that's where that comes in deoxyribonucleic acid. This is ribonucleic acid. See the difference? So that would be one thing you might be asked. You know, what's the difference between DNA and RNA? Right? RNA still has an extra alcohol intact. Right? DNA has deoxy. It's got one of those alcohols off. Okay? So that's kind of the structural business. Now we're going to talk about these bases. So, for you, you don't have to learn all the structures. You don't have to learn their base, like what base they're on. This, these are fancy organic names. These are pyrimidine molecules. These are purine molecules. It's just basically saying when you look at the five possible bases that are found in RNA and DNA, they either have this, right, this purine base, see it here and here, or they have this pyrimidine base here, here and here. It's one or the other. That's kind of the base of the base. 
Like, but for you guys, all you're going to have to learn is these letters and names. And you'll have a chart. You'll have them in front of you. But you do need to understand these letters because they're going to be important. Because the letters are codes. Now, this is so wild. Off of these five codes right here, just those five codes, it codes everything about you. So it's kind of crazy, right? It's the combination of those codes working together that tells me who I am. So that's wild. So we're going to have to get into that a little bit because that's kind of, that's a wild thought, right? So these are somehow codes. And they're codes to say somehow this, this, this combination codes tells me, hey, make this protein, this amino acid. Really, that's what it's telling me. What it could. So we'll learn this how to do this coding a little bit. So again, here's a blow up of the same picture. Now do you see it? Alcohol, the riboses are exactly the same except one is missing, so it's deoxy. This is the stuff in DNA, this is the stuff in RNA. And this is the source of the, okay, I'm gonna ask you guys, is that the five prime or the three prime, that carbon right there? Five prime. Five prime. Good. So if I go down and over one, that's the three prime. Three prime. So if you're looking for that connection, look for that arm hanging off of there. That's the five prime. Perfect. So far, so good. All right. Nice. And if it helps, like you're like, where does that numbering come from? Well, what it comes from is remember back in the naming days, we always said like an alcohol had a priority, right? So if you think about carbons around this ring, the ones next to the oxygen must have the priority. So they get to sign number one. So it's either this side or this side, correct? This side also has an alcohol attached. This side only has a carbon attached. So it goes, aha, you're number one. And then we just, we count around the ring. Number one, number two, number three. And then that's four. And then they break an organic rule and go up off the ring and say five. Remember in organic, we don't break, we don't number off the ring, right? Because the rings are numbered separately than the chains. But that's where that comes from. If you're just curious, you wake up in the middle of the night like, why is that three? Why is that five? No, I'm telling you. It has to do with priorities, which you actually know. You know, right, when I go to name something organically and I I have some different options, burp, 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 because there's things hanging out here and there's things hanging out here, I go, okay, see that? That gets priority, that immediately becomes one. And I start numbering accordingly. They're doing the same thing, only the ether is the one getting priority. And because that, I think that makes sense. All right, so on we go. So here we go, we look up there and we go, oh yeah, there's a five prime end. Then I kind of keep coming down, and there's the three prime end. So, just a lot of facts here. DNA of mammalian cell has about three times ten to the nine. It's three billion nucleotides. Specific sequences of these bases. The way these are ordered: A, G, C, T, A, A, G, C. Well, however it could be, you could think of any variety of that combination. Determines the genetic information that is stored or carried. Specifying the nucleic acids by writing the nitrogenous base sequence. In other words, I can, I can tell you what the nucleic acid is by working from the five prime end and just working my way down this chain. So the very first one is A. So, so the code on this is A G C T. Right? You with me? I wouldn't start from this end because this is the three prime. End. I start on the five prime. End. So I can now start to read it, okay? It's a while that they worked all this stuff out. Since sugar is chiral, there are two distinct ends of the nucleotide. Read from the five prime end to the three prime end. I made that point a few times. Um, what else? And phosphates is what connects the sugars to each other. Simple enough. All right, so now the pairs, 
of nucleic acids connect via is hydrogen bonding. So that thing that holds the DNA together is actually a hydrogen bond. So they don't literally covalently bond to each other, they just grab through space. So remember hydrogen bonds? Right? Fluorine, nitrogen and oxygen bound to hydrogen, right? So here's one, here's a nitrogen bound to hydrogen that creates a, a, a very strong pole. This is, this is positive. Then this oxygen is a dipole, but it has a lone pair, so that's considered a hydrogen bond. The hydrogen reaches out and grabs these electrons. Here's an NH again, but this nitrogen has lone pairs. They reach out and grab the electrons. This is all the NHs, these Hs are positive. These are negative. So they grab just through the same sort of forces we talked about that make things want to be water soluble, that put things into the solid state, raise its boiling point, lower its melting point. Remember that business? Like how do they grab each other? And we went dispersion, dipole, hydrogen bonding, right? This is the strongest of those. But per base, there's actually three attractions. So it's a pretty strong. Because I might think about, okay, hydrogen, water, hydrogen bonds to another water, and boils like at 100. Well, imagine if I had three of those bonds per atom. That would almost triple how strongly they bond. Does that make sense? That's more points of attraction. We learned that before, too. So that's very cool. And we like to point out that Rosalind Franklin was the key to solving the double helical structure of DNA in 1950s through X-ray diffraction. Okay? And I like to point that out because, and this is good in the script, you know, you need to, a lot of times when you think about DNA, you hear the words Craig and Francis. That's two men. But we failed to mention that it was a woman who actually solved the true important part of the structure. So we're like, oops, that's not right. So we're trying to make it right on the slide right here. Like, hey, don't forget it. Actually, it was Rosalind Franklin that should be in there with those guys on that name. So we're learning, but we have a ways to go. So unique structure of DNA allows for thousands of coded messages in small spaces. Now, again, we talked about this kind of concept. This isn't really, per se, a protein, right? It's not a protein anymore. But the same sort of idea is it kind of has secondary structure, right? And then these things we know, like chromosomes and stuff, they're, they're in different levels of being here in the strands. Sometimes the strands open up from each other, right? And then we also know that they start to wrap back on top of themselves. So they might transport, be in the cell, kind of wrapped up and not available for reading. Like, hey, I'm not going to create any protein right now because I'm all tucked away and safe, protecting the code. Does that make sense? That would be very analogous to proteins, right? Or we can consider this a tertiary structure, right? Remember that? Anytime a protein wraps on itself, and you can't really access all of it, we call that tertiary structure. And when we see double helixes, and, and this is not the same, right? It's the proteins make the double helix for the same thing, reason a lot of times they hydrogen bond to each other, but that's called secondary structure, correct? And then if I was doing that kind of same analogy, I'd say, and the, the order of the bases in here is just like a primary type structure, just to kind of remind you kind of those, where those terms came from, okay? All right, so make sure you, and, and by the way, look on your sheet that everybody picked up this second one. I have this note on the bottom of this, because this is important that you remember later, is the pairing. So write on this however you want so you understand. It's on the very bottom. It's just a little bitty piece right here. I just think that's something that you don't have to necessarily memorize, but you've got to know how, what it means when you see it. So if you're sitting there taking the test, you look over, you can use this sheet, right? All right. So it's really interesting that they pair very specifically, okay? So this is actually DNA, this is DNA pairing. So it's not any bases could connect hydrogen bond to any other bases. They're very, very specific. So you kind of need to get a memory, you know, a memory technique and you could use that sheet, but it's ATGC. You know, it's at GC. So, you know, 
my daughter was at GC for a while because she went to Grand Canyon University in Phoenix, so that's cool because she was at GC. <laughs> you. But anyway. And that's kind of helpful because this is DNA, right? And the only thing different, this is so wild. Nature has these little, right? Very unique things. We're just very, very carefully thought out and coded, right? It's not just like willy nilly. Hey, whatever the heck. No, not really. Because we've already talked about their cis fats, right? Very specific. There's uh, what kind of sugars? What's the stereochemistry on sugars? D or L? D. D. What's the stereochemistry on proteins? L. L. Very specific, okay? What's the specificity in DNA? Only AT adenine binds across the thiamine. That's all the holy bridge it's ever made. Guanine only binds across the cytosine, or vice versa. If I have a cytosine, it's going to bind back across to a G. If I have a G, it's going to bind across to a C. Follow? Does genetic mutations come into play? Yeah, so if genetic, so this is super cool. You have things running this thing all the time. They're like, and the head code looks good. If a genetic mutation came in and switched that out, they'd come along and go, I'm going to kill you. And it would kill that cell. It literally doesn't tolerate that. Jeez. So to talk, yeah, again, I'm like, ah, if you're not amazed by the human body, it's like, my gosh, this is well thought out, right? It's like my car going down the street and all of a sudden it's like, oh man, I need an oil change. Clunk, out on the road, here comes a new filter, and then the oil changes and I just keep driving. Have you ever had that happen? <laughs> no, but it, my body does that. Like I'm cruising along and all of a sudden like, oh, I got, you mentioned mutation. Like I went out in the sun, I was having a great time, but apparently some of that ultraviolet light got in and mutated some of my cells, right? So here comes the, well, the checker. Goes, ah, oh, you're not okay. You're out. And fixes it. Like, oh wow, that's cool. And you've seen that happen, right? Sunburn. Oh man, that's screwed up. All of a sudden, new skin. Well, okay, that's good. That's helpful. Pretty awesome. Anyway, just if you haven't thought about that, you should. It's just pretty amazing. But anyway, yes. And um, we actually did some kind of crazy research where they had taken. Um, human DNA, human chromosomes, and they patched them in with Chinese hamster ovary chromosomes. So, yeah, so they could study cancer. And so what happened when you looked at the chromosomes, so now these weren't in the body because the checker would have kicked them out. These were just kept alive, and the reason is then you could do cancer studies. And so you could, you could coat them different colors. The humans are nice and orange when there's a kind of a, they call it fish. You hybridize them, and then it has a fluorescence to it. But the, the humans were orange, and the hamster ovaries were green. So when you made these things, you would have hamster ovaries, green, human over, you know. Cro human chromosomes nice and orange. The hamster chromosomes nice and green, so they were hanging out in the cell together. But then you would expose them to things that were cancer, you know, cancer causing, and then you look in the microscope and all of a sudden you'd have them crossed, orange, green, that sort of thing. And you're like, oh, that was a mutation. That would be obvious, right? It was very cool. It's a very unique system because it didn't die when that happened. But that's because it didn't have the full body checking it. So it's a super cool system. But anyway, that's been studied and it's been used for, for years. In fact, biochemists would just say cho. That's what they, Chinese hamster ovary hybrids. It's, it's a cell line that's been kept alive to study cancer for years. It's pretty wild. It's crazy. So, yeah, I had a little summer working at Colorado State with a guy who was doing it. It was kind of fun. And I'm not a biochemist, so it was really fun. So, <laughs> wild. We grew up like 50 miles apart from each other. Never met the guy, but it's very fascinating. You know, he was an expert. It was fun. All right. So, enough of that. This is all DNA, and the only difference is this: if you get to RNA on this side, these are the bases that are allowable with RNA. So the only difference: uracil replaces thiamine in RNA. I put that in purple just to remind you. 
So this cut, this set and this pairing would happen in DNA. This set and this pairing would happen in RNA. Now, heads up, I just want to this will this will happen here. RNA is not a double strand, so you're like, what? Why am I pairing that? Right? Because it's not made as a double strand. RNA is a reading strand, and when it reads, it reads in this with this kind of complementarity. I'll show you that here in a minute. But for you right now, just you you need both sets. So if you read, can you see the key? Does that kind of make sense? I just tried to say, hey, if you're an RNA, you just replace this guy diamond with uracil, and everything else will be the same. Does that make sense on the key I have there? You can write it however you want. I just hope it makes sense to you. Is that all good? All right. A lot of talking here. None of you don't have to know all this stuff. That's all right. We'll, we'll just keep moving forward a little bit. That's just if it's of interest to you, you can kind of look at it. Ah, we'll just keep moving. So here you go. This is a good picture. This helps you understand. These things I want you to know. This I, I ran it along the bottom one way, and then Lisa put it over here another way. But it's very important. It's basically saying DNA all double stranded and connected is in protective mode. But when it's time to share the code. It goes through something called transcription, which is where it opens up, and then an RNA single strand slips in and starts building complementary code to whatever's in here. So that's where the pairing comes in RNA. What they're saying, is, and so see how it happened? Instead of being AT, it's T, it's A, in, I mean, sorry, it's AU in the RNA, instead of being AT. So that's where that, that coupling code comes in. So let's just let's just compare. This is kind of it takes a minute till you get this and you'll see it. How this would have normally been coded would have been TA in DNA, right? Sorry. AT in DNA. But when RNA comes in, instead of being AT, it's AU. That's the only difference. And then when it goes back and rebuilds DNA, it does the exact opposite. What's that? The RNA attaches to yeah. the Oh yeah, so this is all, and yeah, so this is the template. The coding stays put, this leaves, and then it reattaches, and it's intact. It can be used over and over. It's a coding strand for, let's just, you know, we were talking about this the other day, let's just say it's coding for human growth hormone. Pops open, codes, you know, and keeps doing that all through your teenage years, and then at some point it's like, I'm done doing this. It knows to close and not open back up again. So it's kind of wild, right? So here's the key. Whenever you're in transcription, RNA is now inside the DNA reading the code. You with me? Whenever you're in, then RNA travels alone. So once this is built, it travels off goes to the ribosome, actually, and in there it's reread back and creates the protein. And that's translation. So, transcription, get the information off the DNA. Translation, read that information and produce a protein. So if I was to kind of highlight this a little bit too, I'd say, hey, this particular thing happens in the nucleus of the cell, right? And this transcription is actually happening within the DNA itself, to be very specific. This RNA travels over to the ribosome and it <coughs> translates and creates protein. And then the protein's free to move about the body. This kind of generic stuff I'd like you to understand. Awesome. Come on, watch. 
Chuck. He's got a bad temper. He's doing great. All right. Now, there's groups of three bases are water coating the proteins. So as I see this thing, there's threes, right? So I work in groups of threes. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. So that's one, two, three, four amino acids in the protein. It's a four amino, it's a four protein sequence. You with me? Codons are red in groups of three bases. And that creates a single amino acid. And then that's tied together in the end to make the protein. And that's part of what we'll do today. I'm going to show you how to read codon. That's what that chart's above for. So there's four amino acids there. Yeah, and the, the reason I know that is because I take all of these bases in the RNA strand, divide it by three, I basically get <coughs> four. One, two, three, <coughs> Gotcha. Good? And I'll give you a more, I'll give you a little more detail here in just a minute that'll expand that to be more accurate. Because I can have a little bit more than some multiple of three. But I'll show you how you start reading here in a second. All right, it's a lot on this slide. But this is kind of our key slide to, okay, how do I start a DNA, go through RNA and finally get a protein float around in the blood. Kind of, this is the fundamentals. All right. The cell in the nucleus, this business here, and the ribosome. And they call that the cytoplasm, it's the outer, it's outside of the nucleus in the cell. I hope, you know, I'm not a real biology guy. No, I keep saying that, but I, I've done enough to be dangerous, I guess. Okay, under appropriate conditions, amino acids can polymerize to form the peptide chain. Well, okay, we know that. So she actually just gets down to numbers. I don't, again, I don't prescribe to this, and I'll show you why later. I don't, because I've seen proteins that are four amino acids long. I don't know if I buy all that. So I'm not gonna ask that. We've already talked about all this, right? We've just said, hey, you know, basically what's going to happen to get from these individual amino acids to become this peptide chain is they're going to lose water. And the connection's going to be between the carboxylic acid and the amine, right? That's where the water comes out of. And it's going to make an amide. So that's very fundamental. I want everybody in here to know that. I certainly ask that question. Hey, what's the functional group in this? amino acid that connects to the functional group in this amino acid, and what does it make? Carboxylic acid connects to amine to make amide. And in organic chemistry world, these are kind of flimsy hydrogens because they're an acid, right? You, you lose them. You lose the H+, plus, gain it. This takes stuff on, so it takes stuff on, takes stuff off, so it's a base. It's interesting, when I look at the amide, it's kind of got pieces of both, but it's very robust. And this bond doesn't break very good. In fact, if it helps put it in perspective, this, I'm just talking organic chemistry here. This kind of bond is what's in the middle of uh, Kevlar and Nomex. And if you know what Kevlar is, it'll stop a bullet. It literally will stop a bullet. Right? Nomex is fireproof. I mean, this amide bond is very robust. So you start off with two kind of you know, active bonds, they bond and make this very firm and robust polymer. Does that help? Therefore, if I'm going to unbreak them, because we talked about that, right? We called that, what do we call it if you break apart proteins and make them into individual amino acids? Anybody remember? Is it denaturate, denaturation or is it hydrolysis? Which one is it? Look in your notes, see, we just talked about it a couple days ago. That ain't gonna happen on its own, right? Because it's a very robust bond. You need a catalyst. Can you repeat the question? Yeah, so I'm basically saying, what happens that can break these bonds since they're so strong? What can cleave them and make them back into the amino acids? So 
denaturation opens the things up from secondary and tertiary form. So what's the other one? Hydrolysis, right? That busts them apart. I thought we'd mention that in class. I don't have that specific. Go back, disruption of proteins. Go back, Pete. There it is. Trypsin and chymotrypsin are the one that hydrolyze a peptide bond. So hydrolyze means? Yeah, hydrolyze is where you're basically busting apart. All right, we're going to do some code reading. You guys ready? So how many bases are involved in every amino acid? Three. Cool. And so just so you get oriented, let's, let's get the sheet out that has the amino acids on it. So let's just get oriented. Now we've already said, when we were together last, we said, okay, you don't memorize all of these, but you just generally know, hey, some of them have these hydrophilic groups on them, just chains, right? And those are non-polar side groups. Then we have a lot that have dipoles and amides in it, and we call that polar side groups. And you just generally know, oh yeah, polar side groups like water, non-polar like greasy stuff, right? But then I said there's also acidic and basic side groups, right? You with me and all that? So that's how this is grouped out. You got it kind of, you can see there's four groupings. So this is your own sheet, so you can write on it if you want. So the top ones, I'll just kind of grab this. This is your, right, hydro, hydrophobic group. Can you see it? Because it's just hydrocarbon side chains. The next group down, Yep, then you get to the next one, tyrosine, tryptophan, all that. Those are the ones that would be hydrophobic, they are hydrophilic. They love water, right? They're water soluble. Now I have one unique one in there, and it's tryptophan. It has an NH, so I would circle that one and say it. That's a kind of a unique exception. And the reason is, is anytime I see an NH, I would probably want to put it in a basic group. So that's an exception. It's a unique one where that base doesn't act like a base. And I kind of have questioned, you know, whether I get into all that with you, but for right now we'll just we'll have it on your notes if you'll put it there. Does everybody see it? Trip fan? They've circled it. And I would normally say, hey, if you have an NH hanging out there, we call that the basic group. Which by the way, do you see the basic group? It's right below it. See the NH3s? Yep, on the side groups on the on the side groups on the chains, the NHs and NH3s, those are all bases. And then right to the left, there's two carboxylic acid groups. And those are called the acidic groups. There you go. And then your basic groups. And then I'm looking at this going to see NH2, and I'm like, yeah, yeah. But that's, the end. that's why that's not a, that's an exception. The trip depends on the exception. Has everybody got that kind of classified? Now look at every one of those amino acids. They have a three-letter code underneath them. See them? You know? There's a PHE, there's a LEU, there's a TRP for tryptophan. Is everybody tracking with me now? Okay. So that's all these. Those are the amino acids. So now we're going to talk about the bases and how they code. I'll get my sheet out, too, so I've got it right in front of me. So the first base, so we'll just make one up. We'll say that the base pairs are, so we'll go A, T, U, just like that. Just do it like that. Remember we said in, 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 in uh, groups of three. So if the first base is A, I literally go to this side and go to the first base is A. So that's got me down to this many possibilities. That's a lot. Then I go to the second base. The second base is T. Oh, sorry. That's not going to happen because this is, remember, this is RNA. So there we go. So the second one is U, so that has me down to here. Now, now, I'm, now I'm down in this group. Everybody agree? Yeah, see what I did? I started here. 
If that's you, that lowers me down here. Now it's one of these, and then the last one is you, so that says, aha. And then I look on my amino acid table, that's isoleucine, right? I have L E. That making sense? That's how you read that. And that's actually how the DNA codes. Now, here's the catch, because we were just talking about these groups of threes and how many and all that. There's a start code on, and I've got it circled. This wasn't colored like mine is. But you can get down there and, and highlight it properly. That MET, that is actually a start code on. That's why it's got a round thing about it. A stop code? A start a start code on. So if I look at the letters for that, it's going to be first base, A, second base, U, U third base, G, August. Huh. Code on starts in August. I mean, that's, that's just to help you memorize. It's not real people. Come on. You with me? So when I see AUG, that's actually the code that says start reading here. So when RNA is transcribing, it doesn't start reading until it sees an AUG, then it turns on. Now, I could start with an AUG, AUG followed by another AUG, right? If I have code that looks like this, followed by that again, or anywhere else, it goes, okay, start, and then when it gets here, it reads amino acid, MET. Look on your amino acid chart. Take you a minute. That's methionine. You seeing it? I hope. M18. We're all looking. Everybody's like, that's what. Uh, oh, is it not on there? No. Oh my. That's very not cool. <laughs> I'm always full of good corrections, so I'll see what's up with that while we're on break and then I'll get it fixed. Are there more than 20 amino acids? There are, but I'm trying to think about what's going on here. I, I yeah, because there's 20 on the list. Yeah, so, so something's up with that. I don't know. I'm not sure what's going on there. So. But anyway, that's what that means. That actually is coding for, for an amino acid if it shows up again in there. What if it doesn't show up like that? What if it's just AUG? Is that yeah, still that's just met? a star. Is it still met as an amino no, acid? No, when it's that, so when it reads, it reads five prime, right. and the very first AUG means start. That's it. So don't make anything. Okay. And then after that, it starts make every three. It starts making things. Got it. And then finally, it has to stop. So those ones circled up top, those are all stop codons. So you have a variety of them. So they all start with U, right? First codon, first base U, but it could be UAG, it could be UA. So that's, these are both the same. It's really interesting. All right, first base U, oh. second base A, so UAA, UAG, UGA. Any of those three would stop it. Yes? Um, I think there's two. Fans on here. One of them oh, okay. So where is that? Um, the first one is <coughs> man, oh man. And where's the next one? Second group. Ah, uh, I see it. Yay! That's probably the trick. So yeah, and if so, then I can tell you which one it is. I can almost tell you that. It is the top one. The top one is, is meth. Hey, you guys have a computer or a phone? Just Google methionine. Thank you. And I think that's right because thio is a keyword for sulfur. So I bet you know it. Is somebody looking online for methionine? Can you spell it? Yeah. It's like Thanks. Gosh, dang. I missed that all together. That's it. You nailed it. Good job. 
So that guy, the top tryptophan is actually Oh yeah, it's still meant. Yep. So, you know, you you start reading five prime the minute you see it, it turns on, and then it's going to start reading, reading. Anytime it sees the AUD again, it just makes methionine. It has to be a stop code. And then then it's going to finally get a stop code on when it's done. So as long as you're bracketed between an AUG and a stop code. You just read as is, every three, every three. We'll practice a little bit. Okay, so let's try this one. You ready? Here's one up here. So here's five prime, see it? I did this one easy, I started at the very beginning, but that doesn't necessarily have to happen. So we're gonna work together and we're gonna, we're gonna work on the code. And how's our time? Oh good. Let's see if we can actually build this thing, like really build the amino acid. I mean the protein with uh, structure. And I'll kind of help. You guys can call out what we're going to build. And then I'll start drying it, and you'll get the feel of it, and then I'll let you do one. Okay? We'll work, work together so you can kind of see how this happens. Somebody can kind of start getting down the road and see where the stock is showing up. Or maybe we'll just wander into it, right? Well, no, when we build it. All right. Are we ready? What's UCA? UCA. What is the corresponding uh, amino acid? Three there. <laughs> What, what are the three letter codes? Oh, S E R? Okay, perfect. All right, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to just build it here on the board for you guys, right? It starts with the carboxylic acid, right? And it ends going into an amine. Is everybody tracking with me there? I just need to put the right group on. So I go down and. Is it. Is it is, Slow down. It's just that. Carboxylic acid, that's about to become another amine. That's, this will be true of every amino acid. Right? Because it does this and just keeps making the chain. It's the side groups I'm worried about. So now I go to SER, and I look down there and I find that guy. Doo -doo -doo. Oh, okay. It's basically got a methanol hanging down below it. It's got one carbon and an OH. You see it? Look at the structure of SER on your page. Now, don't worry about the order on the page. I get, it's got amine first and carboxylic acid second, left or right. That doesn't matter, right? These things can just twist in space. We just know that when we build, we build from the carbon back through the amine. Is that good stuff? All right. Next group, UCA, and what's next? GUA or GGU? Is that correct? GLR. I'm sorry, GGU, is that what the codons say? Yeah. Okay, cool. So if I look at that code, what is the code for? GOY. GOY, so glycine, right? I go look at the structure. 
So we have y. And again, I can already just start the structure. You guys understand? If I see this, I know what's going to come next. Carboxylic acid, carbon, I'm next to, I'm to the next amino acid, and it's this that I'm worried about. GLY. What's below on GLY? Oh, it's very simple, right? What's hanging out down there? A hydrogen. Oh, all right, cool. So then I move to the next group. GCA. Look up the code for that. Alanine. hanging out below on this one. So I'm gonna, I'm, again, I'm going to just, okay, here comes the next amino acid. Everything's the same here. Just a carbon. It's a methyl group. All right. And then we go to UAA, which happens to be, in this case, stuff. So that's fine. Then I would just finish this out and go, okay, remember how this NH, they're not NH2s in water, they're using NH3 plus. Remember that? NH3 plus, because this is a minus. In the blood, the, the carboxylic acid deprotonates and it protonates the NH2. So it looks like that. There you go. That's our protein. Wait, we finish the Yeah, because it just has a single carbon on it. Oh, got okay. it. See how that works? Cool. All right. Good time for a break. When we get back, we're going to build some. Sound good? Now, again, don't. I did it very easy. I said, okay, we started with the start, we finished with the finish, but. It could start with an extra amino acid. You're just looking for AUG to start, and that's where you start. And then when you read the final stop, you're just like, okay, I'm done. That's not appropriate. Good? All right. So we'll get I'll get a couple on the board for you guys to play with. It's instead of U A T, right? It's A G. You tracking with me? Is this it's A U G C A T. The, the only difference is, you know, you're right, but U's not in the DNA, right? That's the tricky part of it. Yep. Cool. So that's the actual DNA strand that made that thing. Good. I think I'll put all that together for you guys. You're going to do it all for me, right, when you guys are working as a team? All right, cool. I'll set it up the same way. I'll just give the RNA strand, I'll leave a space for you to build the DNA strand, then below it we're going to actually build the, you know, the code, then we're going to build the protein. And I'll push this out of the way, although you can study it. We'll see that back here in about two minutes. Good, by the way. Good job, you guys. This is perfect. There's a good question, though. How would a proline end up in a protein structure? Like, what would it look like? Because one of the NHs is tied up, correct? Mm -hmm. So that's a really interesting question. So I'm about to do that, but before I do, I'm just going to finish these pictures. Those are good. So, boop, boop, boop. These are kind of nice deep. Practice. Let me try 
uh, I get, if I remember to do it, if somebody emails me and remind me, I can do it. But I can send this to you off my picture, too, if you want to see it. And then you can kind of see what the rocket book images look like. I think it's that big of a on our paper. Good. Yeah, good point. So we start off with proline, only we're going this end, 
right? And so that's the original amino acid, correct? Because yeah, and then this would be on here. So then let's just say we put it next to something else, like, you know, whatever. Basically, what you do is you just remove the water right here, and then that links up. So it looked like that. Yeah. So I was yeah I was trying to get, I was trying to make it loop across so that I was get myself confused. So basically, this would have been here if I was trying to insert it here. It would have gone like that. So is that one more hydrogen on that? The Down here. Yeah, right there. This one? Yeah. Does that have that eight? That leaves because it had, it goes out with the water. So do we not pay attention to it on here? Like it's not on that one? Well, because see it's the For same thing as there. So so all of these in essence when they're making um, um, MI groups, they would be NH2s and C double bond O's. So what you would lose is one H. But since it doesn't have to, it just loses that one H and makes the link. So one H off the nitrogen group and one OH off the carboxylic acid is what makes the water. Does that help? Good question. I'm glad you brought that up. I need that. I should have put that into one of the problems. Anything else? Good. Thank you. Well, good work. That is mine. Got a screen back. That's good. Let's see if we get this back. There it is. Yay. Were we, yes. Were we making amides then? Is that the whole point? Is that You're making protein. Protein. Yes. Okay. So amino acids link it to end to make proteins. And those proteins, as a group, they perform different functions. Right. Okay. That's yep. Right. Yep. As a group. 
so it could be you know you know usually they're fairly long but they're um, so anyway we have other practice that we could do but we could and this would be good you you guys have some other ones that are on here to practice so we'll leave it at that and then this just basically shows the structure built which you get you guys just did this on the screen so that's great you've done this so that's it all that work just to get to this and say you're done <laughs> all right so we'll leave it at that I don't want to jump into new slides because I feel like uh, you got plenty I want